Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to follow on uh, in such a distinguished lecture series. Um, the idea for tonight's lecture uh, germinated uh, on a hot summer's afternoon uh, in midtown Manhattan, uh, specifically at the corner of Lex and 45th Street, which is a bedlam of a place, hot, crowded, maddening uh, on a summer's day, sweltering in the humidity of the East Coast. And I was there because I was finishing Crashed in the summer of 2017 and was doing a final frantic round of interviews. And I'd come to see somebody who worked in the office at 450 Lexington uh, Avenue. Um, and you can always tell in New York the seniority and the importance of the person that you're coming to see by how far upwards you have to travel. Because as you travel upwards in Manhattan, things get calmer, they get more spacious, and they get cooler on a hot summer's day. And where I was headed was a very calm, cool, collected place indeed, the headquarters of Warburg Pincus, a private equity firm. And the man that I was going to see was one of the key figures of the story that I was telling in the book Crashed, uh, one of the key figures of the history of the financial crisis and of American financial politics in recent decades, Tim Geithner. Uh, his career is, is unusual in the sense that it doesn't feature an economics PhD. Uh, amongst American wonks of his generation, this is something you have to make up with the formidable force of charisma and energy that Geithner exudes in extraordinary extent. He's a truly Napoleonic figure. This uh, uh, picture doesn't do him quite uh, justice because it doesn't convey his stature to you. Uh, but working his way up through the Treasury in the 1990s, um, he became president of the New York Fed in 2003, served there through the crisis in 2008, and was appointed by Barack Obama Treasury Secretary in 2009. He'd become president of this private equity outfit in 2014, which is why I was there to talk to him. And the conversation went really very well, perhaps not surprisingly, because I was there to talk to him about one of the untold dramas of the financial crisis in which he played a pivotal role, and which, as I explain in the book, was fundamental to the management of the crisis. Um, because what uh, he had managed was the most unprecedented uh, liquidity provision exercise in the history of global capitalism. Uh, a huge wave of dollars sloshed out from the Federal Reserve System, we tend to say, but in fact, specifically from the New York Fed, from his branch of the New York Fed, into the global banking system. I hope the writing here is large enough for you to be able to see the astonishing fact that of the liquidity that the Fed provided, these numbers are billions, so the four-digit ones are trillions, uh, the trillions of dollars of liquidity that the Fed provided, more than half went to banks that weren't American. Geithner really stands, ought to stand, as one of the heroes of global financial capitalism, for better or worse, because it was the liquidity provision, the lender of last resort action of the New York Fed, which secured the stability of the global financial system in this moment, a key moment in my, the narration of my, of my book. Not only was Geithner responsible for this lender of last resort directly in New York to the global banking system, but he was also the chief instigator of what was in many ways the most remarkable innovation of the crisis, which is the transformation of the European central banks as one European central bank equipped into the 13th branch of the American Federal Reserve System. What did he mean by that? What he meant is that from the end of 2007 onwards, in ever larger volume, European central banks swapped their currencies into dollars so as to provide banks in Europe with additional liquidity funding over and atop what they were able to get in New York directly. Because as Geithner observed at an FOMC meeting in the fall of 2008, they were simply running out of good enough collateral in New York to be able to make the circuit work. What this means from September and October 2008 onwards is that the Bank of England, the ECB, the Swiss National Bank, the Bank of Japan have unlimited overdrafts with the American Federal Reserve System. They can literally swap unlimited quantities of their own currency on demand so as to aliment their banking systems with whatever dollars are missing in their banking sector. This was a, uh, uh, an issue which Geithner pushed determinedly, perhaps on the basis of his brief experience at the IMF, perhaps on the basis of his crisis, crisis fighting experience in the 1990s, something I'll come back to. But anyway, this part of the conversation went extremely well. 
I was enthusiastically recounting to him the technicalities of what was no doubt a delicate political operation, but one which he was only too happy for a historian to recount for a general audience to get the credit which the Federal Reserve Board at the time deserved. And it is indeed an essential stabilizing function, whatever we may think of the long run consequences of this bailout. Without this, the global financial system would have suffered a collective cardiac arrest in the fall of 2008. But Geithner's a dark guy. Uh, he revels in a kind of hard-boiled masculinity. Um, he likes to go to dark places. He likes to recount the dirty deeds that were done in the course of the financial operations that rescued the global financial system. And we did, in due course, go to that intense place. Um, and at one point in the conversation, uh, Geithner let fall a phrase which has stuck with me ever since and I've turned into the title of today's talk. Adam, he said, since the 1990s, I think we've been defying gravity and now I think we're crashing to earth. This is the summer of 2017. We're six months into the Trump presidency. A lot of liberal people across the United States are talking in apocalyptic terms. But this, I have to say, really shocked me. It shocked me in part because of who it was coming from but also because of certain basic assumptions which I've carried with me as a historian, perhaps particularly of Europe, perhaps particularly as one who grew up in West Germany in the 70s and 80s as I did. Why this phrase shocked me is that for somebody of my disposition, America isn't subject to gravity. America is gravity. America is the gravitational force that organizes global power in the 20th century. It's gravity in the sense that manifests destiny, as the American propagandists of the 19th century will describe it, suck literally millions of Europeans westwards into the open territory of the United States, unlocking the largest single mass of uh, resources uh, that Western Europe ever gained access to, the most gigantic land grab, of course, accompanied by a violent genocide of the population of the Native Americans who previously inhabited and lived off uh, this land. Um, on the basis of that, America emerges over the course of the early 20th century as by far the dominant economy uh, in the world system. Uh, the moment, in fact, is 1916, when the output of the continental United States measured in purchasing power parity adjusted gross domestic product, in other words, inflation adjusted gross domestic product, overtook that of the British Empire. It becomes, in terms of throw weights, the single most potent force in the global economy, as a nation state, compared to all of the empires of the world, the United States becomes the dominant force. And it was not just a productive force, it of course shaped a consumer culture that exerted a magnetic attraction on people all around the world, as my brilliant colleague Victoria de Grazia has outlined in her fabulous book, uh, Irresistible Empire, describing in subtle terms the way in which American consumer culture penetrated European society. And penetration's uh, an unduly uh, aggressive, as it were, exogenous kind of phrase, was welcomed into Europe by e Europeans eager uh, to summon it into their lives. America, in a sense, is the projection of European dreams returning to Europe as wish fulfillment. Um, as one uh, uh, acute uh, observer remarked in the late 20s, the European today dreams of a standard of living which he derives as much from Europe's possibilities as from the real conditions of America. Due to modern technology and the communication it makes possible, the international relations amongst people have become so close that the European, even without being fully conscious of it, applies as the yardstick for his life the conditions of American life. He's apt to forget that the relationship of surface area to the population of the American continent is vastly superior. Now, it would have been better if I could have given you that quotation with an Austrian accent, because that was Adolf Hitler from his second book of the late 1920s. It is a consumer culture with a magnetic attraction. As Regis de Bray remarked in the mid-1980s, there's more power in blue jeans and rock and roll than there is in the entire Red Army, particularly if they're worn on the arse of Bruce Springsteen, <laughs> born in the USA, the iconic cover of 1984. More seriously, of course, this translates also into the means of violence. America becomes, in the course of the 20th century, the fabled arsenal of democracy, the driving force in Allied victory in both World War I and World War II. 
So these three things together, the story of productive growth, the story of a remarkable consumer culture, the story of the translation of that into uh, military force, make America for European history, the organizing anchor, if you like, uh, of, of gravity. And this is more than merely an empirical story. It grounds, if you like, a theodicy. It grounds a story about how history evolves in a normatively desirable direction. It founds a philosophy of history, expounded on the basis of a kind of Baudelarized human, humanist rereading of Hegel uh, by Francis Fukuyama in the 1990s in his best-selling essay uh, book, The End of History and the Last Man. Um, but in Marxist materialist terms, it can be translated into the basic idea that America serves as the anchor of global capitalism because in America, the particular and the general are fused. The interests of American capital are simply so capacious that they do indeed encompass uh, the entirety uh, of, the, of the world. And so managing American capital is managing the global economy. The two are, in fact, inextricably uh, intertwined. And in the discourse of liberal international relations theory, of course, um, what we're talking about is the image, the idea of liberal hegemony, of liberal international order. And I had the surreal experience earlier this year at being at Davos at the meeting of the World Economic Forum. And there, there's a palpable sense that the shock that I experienced in Tim Geithner's office is now rippling outwards into the world of policy wonkery and policy debate worldwide. If the United States is now subject to gravity and is crashing to earth, is this the end of the liberal international order being debated everywhere with the accompanying graphics. I was on a panel with a colleague from the RAND Corporation, uh, who, which recently issued with the RAND being the classic Cold War think tank of the American uh, security establishment, which is asking the question of how the values of what they call the post-war international order are being tested. Now, you might say, OK, well, Adam, you heard this all in Tim Geithner's office. What more do you need? That's what Tim Geithner was describing to you. That sense of falling to earth, of America losing its capacity to dominate uh, the international order, of losing its ability to organize imperium, um, that generalizing function of stability, which is so often ascribed to it. But my historian's mind, my historian's conscious was nagging away at me. Because there's something wrong about that elision of these narratives of the current moment as a crisis of international order going back to the post-war period. There's something wrong about that in relation to what uh, Tim Geithner was telling me. Think about the timing. Tim Geithner's rise to stature within the American international economic policy establishment comes in the 1990s. Now, the jarring thing about that is that if he thinks of the 1990s as a period in which America was struggling against gravity, we've misunderstood what the 1990s were. Because in most people's view of the world, the 1990s are the unipolar moment. They're the moment in which United States dominated the world scene and was able to dictate the course of events. So it, perhaps Geithner is revealing something else. And what I want to explore with you today in the, the talk, uh, in the rest of today's talk, is the possibility that what Geithner reveals to us is that these slab-like conceptions of international order against which we contrast our current moment of disorder, in fact, fundamentally distort our understanding of how American power has been configured over the course of the 20th century. Because if for somebody like Geithner, who came into his prime at a moment of what most of us think as unipolarity, thinks that he was struggling against gravity, um, then presumably the story of American power over the rest of the century might need to be rethought too. What I want to actually suggest to you is that our current moment of crisis could be seen against nine previous phases in which American policymakers struggle to articulate power, to shape a world, to in some sense levitate a vision of American power above the circumstances and quite often, indeed repeatedly, came crashing down. I don't think this is merely a matter of a historian nitpicking over details and insisting that things are more complex, which is the kind of menial job that historians are often relegated to. I think what's at issue here is, in fact, a conceptual issue of how we think about order, 
What I'm stressing is ordering rather than order and the disordering effects of efforts at ordering as the real continuity that we need to be thinking about. And that further has the payoff that it allows us perhaps rather differently to situate um, this horrendous moment here, uh, the moment of American carnage, uh, the inauguration speech of January uh, 2017. Because I think what we may be able to do is understand in a more complex way the kind of pressures that are acting on the United States at this moment. We need to consider above all how repeatedly domestic and international forces come together to, put, to place American policymakers in a position which to Geithner in the pomp of American power could feel as though America was struggling to defy gravity. Um, and it will perhaps also allow us to contextualize the situation we find ourselves in today. Just to make sure I get my punchline across without, uh, if, in case I run out of time at the end. Um, the point I want to make to you is that the derailment of American politics over the issue of foreign policy that we face today is not the novelty of our situation. It is, in fact, a recurring feature of American democracy in its struggle to wield international power. What makes our current moment as radical as it no doubt is, is that that can coincides with fundamental changes outside the United States that are indeed uh, epic and historic in their proportions and admit of no patience, admit of no delay. So let me start at the beginning, and don't fear not, I'm not going to take you through nine phases at a steadily measured pace. We're going to go faster and slower as we go along. And let me pass through the first early phases quite quickly, because we're long past the point in which any American historian writes the history of the 19th century as a history of a closed American experience of gradual and progressive expansion out across the territory of the United States. The history of the American West in the 19th century is now written as the history of an empire. A history of an empire amongst others contending with Britain and France, back to the founding, of course, and with its immediate neighbor, Spain, uh, from which America uh, gathers more and more territory over the course of the 19th century. And it is now also universally admitted that America makes a fundamental, short-lived, but nevertheless crucial transition in the late 19th century um, to uh, the state of an imperialist power, um, uh, engaging in competition alongside uh, the Japanese, alongside the Germans, alongside the British, um, in the last final grab for global territory as the global frontier closes. And uh, though not in Africa, America is an aggressive expansionist power uh, in uh, the Pacific and with regard, above all, to the Spanish Empire. This, however, I think makes America like other powers, what makes America's 20th century history of global power different is that in the course of the early 20th century, America transitions from corralling the scrap territories of other people's dismantled empires into becoming the single power which by itself attempts to balance all of the other players in the global system. So to paraphrase this image, uh, this is the significant transition. When America is not playing power politics with Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines, but with Germany, France, Britain, Japan, Russia, and China. And the, we can be quite precise about the moment at which that happens, which is 1916. Why 1916? Well, compare and contrast the situation in 1916 with that in 1914. Take Chris Clark's brilliant book, Sleepwalkers, on the outbreak of World War I. I don't think the United States merits a sentence, perhaps certainly not a paragraph in that account. The United States is not a player in the outbreak of World War I. It's a European affair. In 1916, we see the first American election in which every power around the world is anxiously monitoring the American polls. Why? Because it's clear that America is the underpinning of the allied, more properly, the Entente war effort. And the decision of the American electorate as to which candidate they elect will decide the position of the United States in relation to the European war. And that, in turn, will have decisive ramifications, both for the fate of East Asia and for the European balance of power. 1916 is the moment where this occurs. And the outcome from the point of view of the Europeans is extraordinarily dismaying because they encounter in the candidate who wins, Woodrow Wilson, the American statesman who first, and perhaps most catastrophically, attempts to defy gravity. 
What Woodrow Wilson attempts to do is to keep the United States out of the war, all the better to discipline and subordinate the warring parties of Europe and Asia to, on the basis of the ruins of the legitimacy of their political systems, if the war can be ended with peace without victory, to erect American hegemony and to place America in a position of dominance, even over the most powerful militarist imperialist states of the world. All the more importantly, Wilson is trying to marry this with a domestic reform agenda. And for him, maintaining America's position outside the war is crucially about creating the space in which that reform agenda can flourish. Because Wilson has a rather sophisticated understanding of the way in which militarism and domestic conservatism is intertwined. So keeping America out of the war, using the new instruments of progressivism like the Federal Reserve to hold the warmongering Wall Street interests like J.P. Morgan at bay is the condition of possibility for realizing a progressive program at home. And we know how this story ends. He fails, and he fails catastrophically. He fails first to keep the United States out of the war as a result of the unfettered aggression of imperial Germany, which refuses to take seriously his desire to distance America from the Entente and plunges America into the war by way of unlimited U-boat warfare. And then at Versailles in 1919, uh, whose anniversary we are commemorating this year, in an effort to create a peace without victors in retrospect on the basis of a war which the British and the French with American assistance had actually won, he crafts a peace unsatisfactory to the Germans, unsatisfactory to the British and the French, and it turns out unsatisfactory to the American Congress, which in the Congress fight over the late summer of 1919 refuses to ratify the peace treaty which the first American president to travel to Europe to broker international politics has himself uh, committed himself to. It's a disastrous, shattering delegitimation um, of the American executive branch, of American international authority, and of the League of Nations institutions which Woodrow Wilson has given his name to. If any, at any moment American power came crashing down uh, to earth, it was, surely, it was surely this moment with devastating consequences for the stability of European uh, politics. Not, however, meaning that no new order emerged. This is one of the implications of this incremental uh, uh, approach to the history of international order that I'm suggesting, is that if we don't ever get the glory of a fully instantiated order, neither do we get the vacuum of a completely non-existent structure or system of regulation either, because in the wake of Wilson's defeat, the defeat of the Democrats in the American election of 1920, the Republicans take power, and on the basis of the disaster of Wilson's scheme, they create their own vision of international politics. Now, it isn't and doesn't have the grandeur of Wilsonianism, uh, but it has a deep internal logic, and that deep internal logic is domestic, and its austerity, financial austerity, because the war had transformed America's fiscal constitution. It became a state with a highly progressive income tax and large public debts, anathema to the Republicans. And the way to get out of that was to restrict government spending. And the target, tellingly, of American Republicans is not social welfare expenditure. There's precious little chance of that in America in the 1920s. It's disarmament. What they recognize as the truly destabilizing force in a domestic politics is warmongering militarist aggression. And so America uses its leverage from 1921 onwards to push systematically for a triple policy of disarmament, domestic fiscal austerity, and the whole thing capped by the gold standard, the newly reestablished conservative monetary order of the 1920s. It is why, apart from anything else, liberals and indeed the British Labour Party adhere for so long to the gold standard because in the minds of so many progressives, it's actually associated with this agenda. Economy and peace are on the same, are on the same side. That's austerity and peace are on the same side because what you're going to scrap is the foolish, aggressive frippery of the militarists here, the Italians and the French being brought to heel by the unlikely cartoonish characters here, the Brits, the Americans, and those are the Japanese, believe it or not. But the organizing force in this new system, 
is not the grandeur of Wilson's eloquence or liberal principle, but the dollar. Plain and simple, the dollar as its organizing principle. Because if you sign up to the principles of austerity and the gold standard, you can receive credit uh, from Wall Street. To cite another uh, intelligent contemporary, this time Leon Trotsky, he described balkanized Europe post Dawes plan in, in after, from the mid-1920s onwards as countries uh, reduced to the status which southeastern Europe had once occupied in relation to Paris and London in the pre-war period. In other words, debtor countries subordinate to international control and oversight at the whim of creditors who are now no longer located in the city of London, but located uh, in Wall Street. This is the fundamental organizing force of the 1920s. Not a vacuum, but a new force that sits underneath, deliberately architected by the Republicans in the early 1920s. And it works. It's hugely powerful in constraining the political elites of the Weimar Republic, of Imperial Japan, and indeed even of Mussolini's Italy, but it con is conditional on money actually flowing from the United States. And the American economy is an extraordinary powerhouse um, from the late 19th century onwards, but it has one fundamental flaw. It's massively unstable. From the mid-19th century onwards, the US economy delivers financial shock after financial shock to the global uh, economic system. 1857, 1873, 93, 96, 1907, 1920, 1929, you have to understand, is just the latest in a sequence of shocks that radiate out from, from the United States. The difference is that in the 19th century, the Americans are recipients of capital. In the 20th century, they are the great provider of capital. And that capital flow is anchoring, in absence of any of the other institutions, is anchoring the stability system put in place by the Republicans in the 1920s. And so the Great Depression is a catastrophic shock, not just in economic and financial terms, but the collapse in foreign lending that you can see here from 27, 28 to 29, and then onwards from there, it's difficult to find statistics after this. No one bothers reporting them in nice graphs because they basically go to zero. The absence of the prospect of any further loans uh, from the United States means um, that the disciplining, the disciplining device falls away. And let us go back to another one of our interwar contemporaries and interwar commentators uh, to see the response. Here's Adolf Hitler on the chance this opens up uh, to European fascism. Unless the political leaders of Europe could shake their populations out of their usual political thoughtlessness, the threatened global hegemony of the North American continent would reduce them all to the status of Switzerland or Holland. It is the task of national socialist movement to strengthen and to prepare its fatherland to challenge the United States. And the early 1930s is the moment to do this. The moment to do this and the insurgent regimes, Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, Italian fascism, indeed the Soviet Union as well, respond to this opportunity with extraordinary force. They've seen what can be mobilized against even a country like Imperial Germany in World War I, which went down to defeat at the hands of the Allied coalition. And their reaction is massive. Uh, you can see this. This is one of my, I'm afraid it's a rather technical looking graph, but it's extraordinarily revealing. The thing to focus on perhaps is the numbers down here. And you can see the contrast between the arms races of the period before 1913 and the spending on the military. Take, for instance, Japan or Germany down here in the 1930s. As much as Imperial Germany, the Kaiser's Germany was a militarist regime, Nazi Germany by 1938 was spending nine times more on the military. Why? Because they have learned the lessons of World War I. They know that to challenge the power that Britain, France, and the United States can bring against you, you have to go to this level. The point I'm trying to make, the point that this is building up to, is that this thing that we take for granted in the naturalized story of America's abundance leading on to the arsenal of democracy as a matter of course, is in fact something far more perverse. It's the product of the breakdown of earlier American efforts at order and the massive counter-reaction of the challengers, which in a dialectic of increasing violence forces the United States to become something or opens the door for FDR to choose to make the United States into something that it never was before, which is a hyperpower in military terms. One form of this, which of course benefits Great Britain enormously, is Lend-Lease. We are going to bury 
the entire fascist true under the dam burst uh, of Lend-Lease Aid. And the other, much more distinctive and characteristic and specific to this period, is the commitment of the United States to construct the first truly globe-spanning uh, aerial force uh, the world has ever seen. In May 1940, literally days after Hitler's armies broke through in France, FDR calls for the construction of a 50,000 aircraft program, a gigantic, unthinkably large military program, uh, which by February 1941 has ramped up to 185,000 aircraft. German America, by the end of the war, actually produces 300,000. This is the London Illustrated Daily News' effort to actually represent what 185,000 aircraft look like. You can see it's this awesome swarm, like a swarm of bees. It's a carpet of airplanes a mile wide, 117 miles long. Imagine what that would look like if it was actually extended out to 300,000. Um, in some sense, of course, literally defying gravity, a non-trivial point that Carl Schmitt uh, will make a lot of. American power is power in the air age. It's non-terrestrial. Um, but more uh, basically, the point that I want to make is that American power has to be understood not as the direct and natural product of its inherent virtues, but in some senses as the perverse after effect, the necessary antidote to the reactions that its own failed efforts that ordering have produced in the first round, in the first moment in which America entered uh, the, global, the global stage. This, of course, is with us as a constant fact about America all the way down to the present day. But it is historically novel that America has the massive military power that it does. And it's an artifact of the moment of maximum failure of the pre-war ordering efforts in May, in May 1940. Out of this moment is born a radically reconceived vision of American global power, which you can see people trying to chart by drawing thousands and thousands of little aircraft, um, but you can also see them trying to chart it by literally re-envisioning uh, the globe. Uh, it takes a cartographic uh, reprojection, a reorientation of the world to enable America to center itself as the hub of a global system fighting World War II. These uh, illustrations of the remapped, the azimuthal projection, which allows America to appear as the center of the global struggle from Fortune magazine in 1942. It is also out of this moment of an emergency scrambled American reaction to the failure of the interwar order that we see the emergence of the structure that we take for granted today, America's so-called pointillist empire, uh, a felicitous phrase coined by my colleague from Yale, uh, Bill Rankin, the empire of bases, astutely diagnosed and polemicized against by the French Communist Party as early as 1951. America moves in this phase decisively out of a preoccupation with actually owning territory towards a preoccupation uh, with providing the logistical basis uh, for the projection of power, something that Britain had been preoccupied with, of course, in the days of a coal-fired navy, navy, but now taken to an even more uh, radical uh, degree by America. So this, the moment, this, the twisted genealogy of the formation of America's military power and its logistical underpinnings uh, that we take for granted today, not simply the natural outgrowth uh, that produces genes on the one hand and Sherban tanks on the other, uh, but the result of action and reaction amongst America and, and its enemies. But it is also this moment which founds one of the most hard-to-kill images of America's ordering power and ordering intelligence. Because this moment in the early 1940s is the moment when American liberals are in their pomp and trying to think about the war which they're going to win and the world that they're going to bin, win, in the, the world that they're going to shape in its aftermath. And one of the abiding, central, deeply intelligent ideas is that this depends on providing an economic underpinning to the post-war world. They are materialists, if not Marxist, in their understanding of international order. And so, from the uh, Morgan Fowers Treasury Secretary across large parts of the State Department, they commit themselves to trying to shape an international economic order. And they do this at the EPIC Conference of Bretton Woods in the summer of 1944, where they design 
a system in which the world's currencies will be pegged to the dollar, the dollar will be pegged to gold, the movement of capital will be restricted. Uh, Keynes was there shaping the conversation with the American delegation. He, of course, famously quipped uh, that they have the money and we have the brains. Um, it didn't turn out quite that way, um, but it remains in, as it were, the coils of the collective political consciousness as a key moment in history in which a shaping and ordering surely took place. And for evidence of that, you need not look no further than my hosts at Davos, the World Economic Forum, where uh, Kurt Schwab this year issued uh, a, a manifesto for globalization 4.0, in which he said, we need a new framework for global cooperation in order to preserve peace and accelerate sustainable progress. And then after the Second World War, leaders from across the globe came together to design a new set of institutional structures. Interesting historical slippage in that Bretton Woods was very much during the war, in fact, only a few weeks after D-Day and Operation Bagration, um, but perhaps more convenient to remember it as a post-war conference if what you want to think of is as Bretton Woods as a moment for world leaders to get together and collaborate. This not so surprising. This, I have to say, more so. So these are my friends, David Adler and Janis, Janis Varoufakis of GM25 in the pages of The Guardian. Many of you will have seen this only a matter of weeks ago, concurring with Schwab from the WEF, presumably diametrically opposed in political terms, that what the left needs to do now is to go back to Bretton Woods and to reanimate those institutions as the basis for a progressive politics. Just to illustrate the way in which this moment remains fixed as a fixed point uh, in the political imagination. The extraordinary thing about it is that even an elementary historical narrative of the post-war period will tell you that Bretton Woods serves incredibly ill as the basis for any kind of imagination of a moment of actual agency. Why? Because it didn't work. It didn't work at all, and it failed straight away. Because the aftermath of World War II which even in the United Kingdom was a moment of austerity. People were living amongst the ruins of bombing. Uh, hard rationing was in place through to 1950. It was not a period in which you could implement anything even remotely like this, a fixed exchange rate system with even limited convertibility between the main currencies. The sort of power that we tend to elide with Bretton Woods is much better summarized by this, milk the new weapon of democracy. Now that's New Deal politics in action. This is literally a little German girl being bombed with milk cartons by the same people that were bombing her with other things only six to 12 months before. Um, that is a hands-on vision of what uh, the post-war period and the post-war order might be built out of. And of course, we think of it as being embodied in the Marshall Plan. And often, we somehow confuse Bretton Woods and the Marshall Plan, despite the fact that Marshall Plan is the sticking plaster that was put on the European economies, not coincidentally, in 1947, because that was the moment at which it became obvious that the entire Marshall Plan design would fail, and the hard quite market-orientated wonks in the Treasury would have to be displaced by their Keynesian colleagues in the State Department who took charge of the Marshall Plan and implemented a much more deregist, growth-orientated industrial economic policy from that moment onwards. Not only was this a huge shift in terms of the underlying economics, it was also a huge shift in terms of the underlying vision of power. It was a resolutely, as you can see, emphatically and enthusiastically European but Western European program. So it wasn't global, it was European, and with Europe itself, it was divided because it was emphatically part of the Cold War vision. One of the things which the celebration of Bretton Woods elides is not only that it took place during the war against Germany and Japan, but that it took place before the outbreak of the Cold War, so that the entire tensions which actually dominate the making of world politics after 45 are not present at the creation Whereas the much more limited, much more nuts and bolts, much more restricted vision of order that the Americans put together in the Marshall Plan is entirely dominated. In fact, the Marshall Plan is a driver of the escalation of the Cold War. So this to a moment, which in retrospect looks like the levitation, a kind of Archimedean lever which can be wielded in discussions all the way down to the present day of how we might achieve a grip on the world economy, which in fact, in retrospect, looks more like another one of those Geithnerian moments of defying gravity and crashing to earth. Only, however, again, to be replaced by some new, some new ordering vision. And it is tempting 
once we've got the Marshall Plan firmly in place, and this is our vision of what America was doing, to then move to the situation in which my Rand Corporation colleagues were arguing, which is to say, OK, fine, so let's park the Bretton Woods thing, let's focus on Marshall Plan, then that's the order that we need, and we'll call that the post-war international order, and that's what rumbles on all the way to the present day, and that's what Trump is putting in doubt, because between the IMF and the World Bank and the Marshall Plan, that's what we really mean by liberal international order, and that's what vanquished communism in 1989, and that's what's now at stake. I think it's some sort of historical cocktail like that. And I think if you were to be kind to that kind of interpretation, you'd say it was a Berlin-centric view of post-war history. Because in a place like Berlin, that's kind of how it does look. You move from the airlift, again, those children not being bombed, um, through to 1961, the construction of the Berlin Wall, and to 1989, and then on from that to Angela Merkel as the leader of the free world. And we have that vision of a consolidated post-war period dominated by an American power as a benign hegemon, which is now slipping away. And it's not by accident that the agony over Trump is most acute, perhaps, uh, in Germany, uh, which, whose entire history is, in fact, shaped by this trajectory. But if you take any other vantage point in the world system, even Britain's, but that's not the most interesting vantage point, say you were going to go to Asia, it's evident that this story of a super long Cold War, starting in 45, rumbling on to 1989, and now perhaps being resumed by Putin, is just fragmentary. It's incoherent. If you look at Asia, it's not clear that the Cold War, in the form of the early period, well, ever really existed. It was never cold. It was super hot in Korea. It was a massively violent conflict there. America continues on to an extremely violent conflict in Vietnam, which after the stalemate of Korea, it actually loses in Vietnam. And then instead did the grand strategic move, which in America is still celebrated to this day, as the pivot out of the Cold War, in fact, aligns itself with Mao's China or post-Maoist China the loss of China in 1949 having actually triggered McCarthyism to a very considerable extent. So from the point of view of the Cold War as seen as an American problem in Asia, you could argue that the Cold War as we know it actually comes to an end in the 1970s, with spectacular consequences, of course, when we think about a new world history centered on China in the present moment. But it doesn't only Asia that suggests this the need to revise the chronology. I mean, all of the best historiography of, re of recent years has focused on the fact that really the 1970s are a key break point. Another moment, if you like, in which an order, the one established in 47, broke already. And what American policymakers had to do is to scramble to reinvent the way in which their power was going to be deployed. And it was then, as now, a dramatic interweaving of domestic and international politics. It's hard to exaggerate the combined impact on the United States of the civil rights revolution of the 1960s, the cataclysmic humiliation of Vietnam, the crisis of democracy talk of the 1970s, and the urban crisis into which the civil rights revolution issued by the 1970s. That literally, Welcome to Fear City, is a poster handed out by the New York Police Department to arriving tourists at JFK in 1975. <laughs> so if we think that America's politics is disordered now, we need to have a historical reality check. Um, part of the backdrop to this is an unpicking of the international economic order. Bretton Woods failed in 47, as I'd said, but it did finally begin to operate stutteringly from 1958 onwards with free movement of capital. So rapidly did the capital begin to circulate that by the late 1960s, it was obviously going to be painful to maintain the dollars pegged to gold, and a politician like Richard Nixon was not the kind of politician to take that kind of political pain. And on the 15th of August 1971, he abandons the gold peg. The result across the Western world is inflationary instability of the likes of which uh, uh, Europe has never experienced outside wartime. And so another arc, another moment of ordering, another moment of ordering that is, as it were, elided within this post-war vision is the fact that the post-war order, so-called, shifts dramatically 
from the 50s and 60s Keynesian moment to what we, of course, sometimes describe as neoliberalism, but also might be described as the world that Paul Volcker gave us with the Volcker shock of 1979. Setting aside the problems of deregulation and privatization and so on, the epic hike in US interest rates in 1979, which ushers in the end of this inflationary period, deserves to be described as another moment of powerful rethinking of how politics uh, uh, and economics ought to operate in Europe. In other words, again, let's break down this continuity and understand the way in which it has constantly had to be re-engineered, constantly had to be rethought, both with regard to the international order and its domestic underpinnings. In Europe, even the story of the Cold War doesn't really stand up as a continuous story. In the early 1970s, we see dramatic efforts to defuse the struggle in the period of détente, followed, as we, many of us in this room anywhere will remember, by the extraordinary escalation of tension which took place from the late 1970s and early 1980s onwards, centred above all on Europe, not Asia, thinking above all about uh, the deployment of uh, medium-range uh, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, precisely that network of treaties which is being unpicked at this moment, centred on increasingly vivid fantasies of conventional war uh, in Eastern Europe, in which America would fight at a disadvantage rather than fighting uh, with, superior, uh, with superiority. So much as we might want to imagine that it's Bruce Springsteen's genes that win the Cold War for us, we shouldn't underestimate the spectacular risks that were run in achieving the neat outcome, which retrospectively, of course, can be explained in terms of the inevitable dominance of the American consumer way of life. Perhaps most dangerous of all, the fall of 1983, November 1983, and the nuclear uh, exercise of Abel Archer 83, uh, where the Soviet Union and the United States perhaps come closer than ever before uh, to ever since, and at least since the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, to uh, an actual nuclear, an actual nuclear exchange. So not only like World War II is the construction of the inevitability of American power a retrospective one overlaid over something which is an interactive, extremely violent and risky dialectic, but we also in this case in particular have to reckon with the role of another party in constructing this moment, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and his key role, so absent from so many American accounts of how the Cold War ends, in ensuring that it ended with a whimper and not with a bang, uh, which is how, in the early 1980s, it looked as though it might. But if there is a moment to come to the concluding phase of my talk now, to reconnect to Geithner and to the 1990s onwards, if there is a post-war moment which Davos uh, and their ilk have reason to hanker after. It's surely not the aftermath of World War II, it's the aftermath of the Cold War that they're actually thinking of. Because this is the moment in which America truly is, as a result of this complex story in which American power is only one part of the equation that I've been telling us so far, by hook or by crook, by accident or by, des by design, through logic or in some senses also accident, uh, the United States emerges as the absolutely dominant player. This is the moment in which the globalization, the, the international liberal order so often ascribed to 1945, actually comes into existence. In 1944-45, they had conceived of an international trade organization that was supposed to produce globalization, but it was aborted by 1950. Congress voted it down. In its place had come GATT, WTO, the agency, if you like, not just of globalization in itself, but for itself, the self-conscious institutional manifestation of globalization comes into existence, not coincidentally, in 1995. And it's that organization which China is shoehorned into in 2001. So the story of globalization that we back project into the earlier 20th century is in some senses much more recent than we give it credit for. It's really an artifact of the last uh, 20 to 30 years. Which brings us back to my question, which I began with, why is Geithner so anxious about it? Why did it seem to a participant like him like such a knife edge exercise? Well, I hope in light of what I've said so far, you can see that a lot of the time, the exercise of power by the United States has seemed like more of a knife edge exercise than you would give it credit for. 
But let's be more specific. What were the problems that Geithner and his ilk faced? Well, there's a great anecdote told about the beginning of the Bill Clinton's presidency in which Clinton in his pomp wanders into the cabinet office to meet Robert Rubin, uh, formerly of Goldman Sachs, now his chief economic advisor, and announces, I'm the leader of the free world. To which Rubin responds, that's nice, Mr. President. <laughs> the problems that the Clinton administration faced should not be underestimated. Forcing through NAFTA, which is the great opening move of the United States, took all of the political capital of the uh, Clinton administration in its early years. Much of the energy that might have gone into healthcare went into NAFTA instead. This is a point that will have significant consequences for the very end of my story in a few minutes' time. The Clinton administration faced enormous pressure on the home front from the bond market. This is the moment in which Jim Carville, the great political advisor to the Clinton presidency, remarked that if there was reincarnation, he didn't want to come back as the Pope or a famous baseball player. He wanted to come back as the bond market because you could intimidate anyone. This is, this is the, the, the logic of globalization unveiled and turning itself back on the United States. It's the Richard Nixon moment revisited 20 years later in which America loses control, as the Sorcerer's Apprentice does, of its own artifact, the globalized, financialized economy. The problems in America were acute, but what made Geithner's career were problems elsewhere. The reason he's getting this promotion in 1997 is that he was one of the Sherpas working the near endless crisis fighting efforts from 1995 uh, to 1999. Much as globalization, as I'll show you in just a second, was from the point of view as glo of global economic growth, a success story in bringing more and more emerging market economies towards convergent growth. It was crisis risk from the moment that it really got going. First of all, in the tequila crisis of Mexico in 1994-95, here Robert Rubin, uh, the same man shaking Geithner's hand there, signing with the Mexican president, a large loan squeezed out of Congress just in time uh, to save Mexico from going down the tubes, only a year after Clinton has tied Mexico into NAFTA. So you can imagine how tightly correlated uh, these high wire acts are. And then by 1999, Larry Summers, uh, Greenspan and Robert Rubin being celebrated as the committee to save the world. Because by that point, they had indeed uh, orchestrated, extremely lopsided, inegalitarian, but nevertheless bailouts of much of the East Asian economies and Russia. Not only is it striking that they're going to have to do this work, but I think it also throws light on the sort of mentality, the sort of self-conception that America, the wielding of American financial power uh, requires. This is much more superheroes uh, than it is lawmaking. In other words, it's a desperate firefighting effort. It's what Rubin is referring to when he says to Clinton, well, that's very nice, Mr. President. Uh, you are indeed in charge of the free world. Well, good luck with that. That is what the 1990s taught this generation. Much as they are free market, much as they are cookie-cutter neoliberal in many, many respects, they are acutely conscious of the fact that it, maintained, it requires constant attention to make this system stay on the road. And nevertheless, the system was in its own terms working. One technical graph for this evening. This is the correlation between uh, national income of societies and their growth rates. And what this is showing is that over the period from the 1960s through to the late 1990s, there is no, there, if there is a correlation, it's positive. This is terribly bad news for the global economy because what it means is to grow fast, you have to start at a high income. You grow fast if you're already rich. The effect of globalization from the 1990s onwards is to invert that relationship. For the first time, it actually becomes true that the liberal promise that if you are underdeveloped and therefore have resources to develop, you will actually grow, comes true. And it comes true on a spectacular scale as more and more emer so-called emerging markets, we in fact lose the, the terminology of the third world, Everything now becomes the possibility of growth, an emerging market. The BRICS is one of the key slogans of the period. Quite suddenly, it becomes true that the poorer you are, the more rapidly you're likely to grow. Now, that is the vindication of neoliberal economics at its, at its heart. And it has had undeniably and spectacular effects on global society, including also, of course, an increase in inequality around much of the world. But from the point of view of governance, 
Even succeeding in this way creates huge problems. By the late 1990s, it's clear to people like Geithner, when he talks about gravity, what he's also talking about is not just internal domestic politics in the United States, which made NAFTA so hard. He's not just talking about crisis fighting. He's talking about the fact that he now has to contend with n number of extra players in a global system which is much, much more complicated. And in an absolutely classic, I would submit, ad hoc exercise in ordering rather than order, What they set themselves to do in 1999 is to expand the G8 by, well, what would be a round number? 12. Let's make the G9, the G8 with the Russians, let's make it 20 instead. And Geithner and a German colleague literally went down two tables of population and GDP, calling out the numbers and going, South Africa in, yeah, Nigeria out, yes, Egypt out, Indonesia in, Singapore out, South Korea in, and re-architected the heart of the global governance system for financial policy. Never a reference to the United Nations, no effort to secure broader legitimacy in any other way other than an ad hoc pragmatics of who do we have to have in the tent pissing out rather than outside pissing in. And from the point of view of global economic governance, it's actually kind of worked out for them. They no doubt did not anticipate that the first meeting of the G20 as a meeting of heads of state rather than finance ministers would take place in Washington in November 2008 in the dying days of the Bush presidency as the global financial system collapsed around them. On the other hand, if the global financial system is collapsing around you, it's kind of handy to have this uh, political forum to convene. And the person, of course, who benefited most from this was Gordon Brown. This is his greatest moment, when in some senses he may in fact have saved the world, um, convening the G20 in London for its large-scale announcement, not of the fiscal stimulus he would have liked, but for a massive recapitalization of the IMF, uh, which was crucial in handling the financial troubles to come. To conclude... The interesting uh, story is not what was happening, however, and this is the classically American side to this, is not what was happening at the G20, but what was happening behind the scenes. Because the other deafening lesson that Geithner's uh, generation of American policymakers have learned is that the gravity that they have to deal with is as much inside the United States as out. And what American Democrats have to reckon with at this moment is that though the United States is a two-party system, from 2008 onwards, it's become evident that it only has one party of government. Um, I say this with so much clarity and emphasis because at the crucial moment in 2008, when it looked like not just investment banks, but the entire government-sponsored backstop of the American mortgage system, what makes America a home-owning society, the so-called government-sponsored enterprises, as they were folding... Under a Republican presidency, the Republican Congressional Caucus informed the Bush presidency that it could not count on its votes to support the bailout of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. All of the vital uh, 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 crisis-fighting instruments that were put in place between 2008, insofar as they had legislative backing, depended on the majority won by the Democrats in the American Congress in 2006. It's a sort of shocking historical fact, Um, but it depends on that fragile congressional majority that the Democrats held between 2006 and 2010. Without it, it's very unlikely that that political platform would have been there. And Congress, in fact, did vote down TARP once in September 2008 with catastrophic consequences for market confidence. Now, how do we explain this? Well, you could go to the obvious. Um, a total trivialization of American <laughs> politics. Sarah Palin nominated uh, as McCain's running mate is the evident precursor of Trump in so many ways. But at a far deeper level, this has been an accident waiting to happen for a very, very long time. And it goes back to that rupture of the 60s and 70s that must underpin any coherent account of how American power operates uh, today. It goes back to Richard Nixon and the Southern strategy of the late 60s. At that moment, American party politics was reconfigured around the issue of civil rights. And the Republicans seized the disaffected white vote driven into their hands by the Democratic sponsorship of civil rights. And from this moment, with Rich and Dixon declared as the candidate of Dixieland down to Trump being declared the candidate of Dixieland in 2016, there is a a direct line. The consequence of this for the wielding of international power is that from the late 60s onwards, 
The American Republican Party was banking on its ability to segue a populist, xenophobic, nationalist base with a globalist business community which, whose interests uh, were very well represented in Washington by way of the big law firms and the big lobbyists. That is what snapped in 2008 when the Congressional Republican Party announced that it couldn't give the votes for the bailout. And it's the subsequent disintegration of the party and its capture by the authentic voice of the base, and not, Donald Trump is nothing more than that, um, that has led to the, the massive uh, disorientation of our present moment. But it's a tension which goes back to the late 1960s. And you might think that this sounds like an extraordinarily fragile base on which to found a theory of American power. But think about the historical precursors for this. The New Deal and the FDR and Truman administrations, which for so many of us stand as the political agency that made Bretton Woods, that did the Marshall Plan, that did the New Deal, that agents all of this, what was its political coalition? Its political coalition consisted of Northern liberals, Northern uh, uh, progressives, Northern labor, and the solid South. In other words, the vote that has now shifted to the Republicans. People who vote Democrat in the South through the 1960s. Why? Because Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. That is the fundamental basis domestically of the New Deal coalition. The general point is that America's international power and the agency of its technocratic managers has always been founded on twisted and complex political coalitions which reflect the profoundly contorted Ameri entry of the United States into modernity and in which, like it or not, and parochial as it may seem, the race issue is absolutely central all the way down to the present day. So in this respect... In all of these different ways, the crisis that we're experiencing in the United States today is perhaps not as historically radical as we're tempted to think it is. It is no doubt a rupture in its violence and in its uh, ridiculousness and buffoonery. It is no doubt you know, an astonishing low point. But structurally, it is similar to so many other moments um, uh, uh, in the history of American power, which are obscured when we contrast it to a reified, simplified vision of the exercise of power growing out of the inherent strengths of American society and American civil society. What makes our, truly, our moment truly a discontinuity, I would argue, and perhaps we could discuss this in Q&A if you're interested in following up on this, is the conjuncture of this recurring moment of American political deadlock with the true uh, challenges of our current moment, which is summarized, I think, in the two words uh, of China and climate change. And that, for future generations of gravity-defying American technocrats, is, I think, the challenge of, future, of the future, how they address those two issues which are now so urgent, so pressing, so defining of our current reality, and are, of course, when you look at the CO2 emissions figures, exactly the same question. The idea that a Green New Deal, as attractive as it is, and as much as one might want to applaud it, any longer can provide the solution to the global problem, is, to my mind, a retrograde, anachronistic uh, throwback to the moment at which America did actually stand at the center of the world. But with regard to the CO2 problem, uh, that's no longer the case. America, like the rest of the West, is a bystander in a drama that will be decided by other people. But that political challenge of accommodating ourselves to that reality uh, is what, is what uh, American uh, political elites as European political elites are up against. And um, it will be in the mode, I would submit, not of the creation of a new order, but of a new generation of ordering efforts uh, with all of the fragility that that implies. Thank you very much for your attention and patience. Thank you for that. Um, China was actually exactly what I wanted to ask you about. Um, would love to get your thoughts on um, the extent to which China is muscling in on America's methods of shaping the world world order, by which I mean obviously um, you know, their plans for technological standards, their sort of self-sufficient industry, building of the bases in like Maldives, Sri Lanka, Africa, et cetera. Should, I, should we bundle them or should I take them one by one? Maybe two at a time. Can we have the one at the back? One at the back. Just, just by way of the uh, mic. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, your, the gist of your argument is that we want, if we want to understand the Geithner moment, we need to go back to the 90s. Yes? Yeah. 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 If, 
it's that true, uh, how is it different from the usual story that is told about crisis? The usual story is that the crisis is the outcome of international neoliberal order that was really, yes, started in the 80s, but climaxed in the 1990s. If that's the case, what's the difference between your argument and the usual story told about the crisis? Uh, so I, I should perhaps not have simply said yes when you, when you said that. Uh, no, that, that's... Uh, obviously, it's true that to understand Geithner, one has to understand the 1990s. My point was that since the 1990s are generally seen as a unipolar moment, a moment of absolutely maximum power, if one of the key exponents of power in that moment is referring to his experience of the exercise power, of power as an exercise in defying gravity we may need to have a more complex understanding of how American power in general is wielded, because that would seem to be the moment in which you would have been going with the grain, in which gravity was on your side, and yet that's not how it seemed to somebody like Geithner. And so in thinking in general about how power is exercised, we may need to take a more fragmentary view, we need to, may to, need to take an offer of view which accounts for action and uh, and and, uh, and counteraction, uh, which recognises the forces which are trit, undermine, uh, question uh, Amer the exercise of American power, and have constituted a history, therefore, which is what I was trying to lay out for you, uh, of which is much more broken uh, than the sort of history which is invoked when people say, "Oh dear, Trump is breaking the liberal international order or the post-war international order," because. On close inspection, no such thing seems to have existed. What we do see is a constant series of Geithner moments which are efforts to structure a more or less advantageous position uh, from a position of advantage necessarily, because we're writing the history here of, German, of the United States, not Germany or Japan or even the declining British Empire, but nevertheless are not moments, if you like, of sovereign decision on America's part. And so that's, that's what I, I was using. I was using the Geithner uh, anecdote as a, as a crowbar to break the kind of ossified, simplified notions of order, which is so often invoked as, uh, as a contrast to our present moment. Um, on China, I do think it's really interesting. For me, the, I like the way in which you, you describe the Chinese challenge as the repurposing and instrumentalization of, uh, of American techniques. I thought, in this respect, the Asian Investment Bank was particularly, was particularly, was an early experiment. Uh, and um, so this was this bank the, the Chinese proposed in 2013 at a moment when Barack Obama wasn't even able to attend the ASEAN conference at which the Chinese launched it because the Republicans were holding the American budget hostage. Uh, it was one of those kind of moments of dysfunction. Um, and uh, it's a multilateral investment bank with, with various types of international oversight. It looks totally kosher. It looks exactly like a kind of a Chinese-inspired version of a post-war World Bank type thing. And the American knee-jerk response, which I think is now they recognize was a mistake, was to say, don't join. No one join. And it was Cameron in his maximally pro-Chinese, blissfully um, uh, hubristic moment who said, oh, no, we'll join. Um, because Britain was playing. Uh, and to a certain extent, of course, this strategy has worked out, a strategy of positioning the city of London as a hub for the globalization of Chinese finance. And then everyone else in Europe joined along with them. So that strategy didn't work. So I think what that suggests is that this is a promising route for the Chinese to go down. And uh, one of the uncomfortable things that we're witnessing, um, and this is a sense in which I think the Trump administration really does mark a, you know, a new phase in ordering, and it may be that, that what the Americans are doing, faced with this Chinese bluff-calling strategy of saying, well, right, if you're serious about multilateralism, we'll do, we'll do multilateralism and see whether you go along. Then the Americans say, oh, no, no, because it's Chinese. And then the Chinese say, well, you're not serious about multilateralism then. The Americans just cut through all of that and say, no, you're Chinese, so no. Um, which is what we're seeing over technology now. That's the, that's, so they're stripping away. And for, for people who are committed to the WEF game, right, the Davos game of everyone playing nicely and positive sum and Bretton Woods is the moment where post-war leaders sat down and collaborated on designing a, you know, a post-war world. Um, if, you're, if you're in that kind of haze, then the new clarity in Washington is, is profoundly corrosive and upsetting. Um, and 
from the Americans point of view however they could simply say this is a return to the classic strategies that we pursued against Comic Con in the 50s and 60s this is no different from the kind of struggles we waged against the transfer of German technologies of the Soviet Union in the 1970s this too has pedigree on the American side and for that reason it's also very bipartisan. I mean, one thing we should not kid ourselves about is that the escalation of tension between the Chinese and the Americans is down to Trump. Uh, he may have unleashed it, but at this point, Trump is probably the guy looking for some kind of a deal so that he can look good before the electorate. What's happened is a much more serious thing, which is the security policy establishment in the US and a large part of the Democrats too, are signed up to fronting up against China on a range of issues from strategic concerns to human rights. And that is something that's going to be much harder to put back in the box if that is indeed the intention. It's about hegemony, not trade. So, it, yes, to that extent now we've moved into an open struggle. And it's not even, you know, it may be something, I mean, the, the national security document they issued may be, may be quite right. It may not even be about hegemony. It may just be about great power competition. So hegemony is presumably the situation in which you don't have to recognize your antagonist, in which you've squashed the debate, right? So that's when you really hegemonize. We're, we've lost that moment. Uh, we're, we're in, uh, as the Americans say it explicitly, in an era of great, great power competition for control of what they call the Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much. I think perhaps the most chilling moment for me was the Dixieland image and the continuity between mm. the 60s and Trump. Mm. And when you, when you were just talking about Ch you're Chinese, so no, you're talking racism, right? So mm. racism is somewhere central to the, continu the chilling continuities that you're describing. Mm -hmm. But I was also very struck by the fact that apart from the little girl and her milk and Nancy Pelosi right at the end, there are ho and one woman at Davos, mm. There are no women in this mm. story, mm. right? So the mm. other struggle going on in the 60s mm -hmm. is the feminist struggle and the women's rights movement and the women's liberation movement. And that surely is also central to what's happening with Trump now. If you think of the Kavanaugh affair and how that gave the Republicans a huge electoral boost. Mm. So I just wondered where that key struggle figures in this narrative. Uh, can, I, I, can I respond directly to that? That's, that's, such, a, that's such an interesting question. So um, on the issue of race, um, um, yes, absolutely. There's a, there's a, there's a dist I mean, it, it's difficult, I think, for Europeans to understand how central China is in the historical political imagination of the United States. I mean, it's much, much closer and more present. And all the way back to the days of the late 19th century with the racial exclusion laws directed against Asians, uh, Japanese and Chinese, it's a dominant feature in the politics of the West Coast of America in particular. Um, and the Asianization of America, the Asianization of uh, real estate markets in critical parts of the US, of, of education. We, we have, after all, the great law case brought by Asian Americans against Harvard over explicit policies of discrimination they pursue against Asian applicants to American universities. Um, there is a there is a um, undercurrent there uh, that uh, has the capacity for, for racist mobilization. There's, there's no question at all. Um, and it cuts, cuts horribly uh, across the divides of American politics. As we saw in the riots of, in the LA, I think in the 1990s, where Korean shopkeepers were targeted by enraged uh, African-American uh, rioters. So it's a, it's, a, it's a truly toxic brew. And I was at a meeting with the president of my university earlier this week in which he was describing how in closed-door meetings with the FBI they're basically being told to regard with skepticism the application of any Asian, uh, any Chinese student uh, applying to study at a university like Columbia, uh, just on the basis of their nationality. Now, if you've ever been to a, a big American university, you'll know what a wrench <laughs> that would imply. Uh, Asian students are a huge part of our, uh, and brilliant contributors to the culture of our university. This is incomprehensible uh, for our institutions to really figure out. The, the issue of gender is, is really fascinating. Um, and it really, it actually really causes me to think through how might one might retell this. I think you're right that one moment of this is the 60s and 70s. Um, and one could tell a very similar story in that the Republicans reconfigure around an explicitly masculinist politics against a backlash politics, um, with the Democrats having owned the progressive uh, feminist agenda. 
And that's clearly running hard all the way through to the Clinton administration, uh, the Clinton bid for the Clinton bid for power uh, against Trump in 2016. But you could even wind it back to uh, the age of Wilson uh, in 1916, 1917, 1918, where feminist politics is a huge issue. Uh, in the United States. We're moving to the moment when women will actually be enfranchised rather reluctantly by the Wilson administration. But there's no doubt in the party political spectrum that Wilson is broadly speaking on the side of emancipation and enfranchisement. And what's very interesting is how it plays into anti-war politics. I mean, Wilson in his anti-war position is bidding for the pacifist vote and that vote is thought to be, or the opinion is thought to be feminine. So there is an explicit mobilization of gender around an anti-war politics, which is itself not power neutral, but thought as a means of power, but it's soft power, if you like, to be exercised against the crazed Europeans. And American feminists like Jane Adams offer extremely compelling readings of how America might act as an antidote to uh, the militarization and the masculinization of European politics in this period. And they are amongst the victims of the collapse of the Wilsonian, of the Wilsonian program in that respect. They are, but it remains a really fascinating element in American politics, which is then remobilized in the Vietnam War period. The legitimacy of anti-war opinion in a society which is not one structured by conscription. America has rarely had, except in the period in and out of the Cold War from World War II through to Vietnam, it's not like Germany or France, a society structured around the construction of masculinity through universal military conscription. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier is a popular hit in America in the 1920s. I mean, that's not imaginable in Weimar Germany. I, well, maybe in Weimar Germany, but certainly not in Imperial Germany. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. <laughs> that, 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 and this is, a, this is a mother singing this song. So the, the resource of that kind of feminism in American politics and the, the tension of mobilizing it, if this talk had been more squarely focused, I think, on the military side, it would have been, it would have been more obvious how that, how that runs through. Um, I think that's a, that's, a very interesting, that's a very interesting idea. In the crisis fighting, th there are p plenty of key female ca characters. I mean, Janet Yellen is, is probably one of, one of the really unsung heroes. Whether her, whether her position as a woman, whether her identity as a woman makes much difference, that I, I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, but the seizing on Geithner was a, kind of, uh, was a largely accidental thing in that sense. I mean... We have another question. question yes, in the middle here, and one at the back. Thanks very much for a fascinating talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the WTO. Um, you talked a lot about the IMF and central banks and, and the US role there. Um, the WTO is, is the arbitrator but can no longer make rules. Yeah. It quite soon probably won't be able to arbitrate, yeah. either because of the failure to appoint judges or uh, it will rule against America and America will ignore it yeah. with the same, same result. What happens when that inevitable, inevitable failure uh, uh, takes place and what's the impact on, on the US, perhaps the, the rest of the OECD and the sort of large middle income yeah. The Indias and Chinas. So, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, you're asking me to speculate about a highly technical topic. Uh, what, but it's a totally valid because this is one of the ways in which you could say the situation that we're in is unprecedented. We have the, the key actor in the system hitherto systematically acting by means of a series of boycotts. The Americans refuse to allow the appointment of new judges to vacant seats. It's really blatant use of procedure to derail the entire system. The point I guess I would warn against, and it follows from the logic of my argument, is that that, that disordering doesn't give way, as it were, simply to anarchy. It gives way to a new set of force fields. And that, obviously, is the American intention. The idea is not that they won't get their disputes arbitrated. It's that in bilateral, force-on-force -force type negotiation, they have a better hand. Um, this is the Lighthizer kind of opinion, right, that the... That, that, the, the general laws are good for weak powers in the system and have been used as a, 
a set of instruments uh, to win suits against the United States. It's not actually that much evidence for it, but people like Lighthizer are convinced that that is the logic of general rules-based systems. So better for the United States to break that rule-based system and rely on its heft to negotiate one-on-one -on -one with anyone that it's in a dispute with, which is what it's trying to do with the EU over cars, what it muscled the Canadians, the Mexicans, the South Koreans into. This is their kind of vision. The extraordinary thing about it is, you know, one can understand why that would be a strategy. And again, it's not without precedent. It's the kind of thing America did in the 1980s. That's why Lighthizer, the trade representative, won his stripes, doing precisely this to the Japanese over trade. So again, pointing to the way in which, you know, in a kind of a simplistic idea of the liberal order after the post-war period just elides all of those kind of moments of struggle that were unleashed by the industrialization of Asia in the 70s and 80s. And that is what's reverbing in the current moment. The question, of course, is why there isn't the longer-term vision, right? I mean, the Brzezinskis and so on of the Democratic Party, the grand strategists, the counterpart to Kissinger in the 90s have been always arguing that given the longer-term trajectory, given that vision of gravity, that China in the long run will supersede the United States, America must have an interest in now cementing a strong multilaterally based institutions of laws and rules so as to be able to then use them against the potential counterpart and to force the Chinese, I think maybe he's gone already, to force the Chinese to consistently buy into that rule system was the play. And what I think is really difficult to understand is why, why that logic doesn't penetrate. It isn't, Lighthizer isn't without rationale. He's not simply a force of disorder. It's just that it's difficult to understand what the longer term strategy might be. Um, <clears throat> yes. Very fascinating, but let me pose that possibly what you provided us was a political history from the top down. Yeah. And if we consider, for example, uh, Michael Kalecki's warnings in the 40s that full employment and Keynesianism would eventually fail and result in a neoliberal, you know, overgeneralizing a neoliberal response, yeah. um, we are now confronted with Trump and Brexit, which I would argue. Uh, doesn't speak to your narrative, but really represents 45 years of disregard of, let's call it the bottom half of society. And so there's a complete rejection of traditional politics. And the irony is that neither Brexit nor Trump are going to be able to satisfy the demands of the people that support them the most. So I think therein lies a real crisis in that the Trump agenda, the Brexit narrative... Um, is, you know, speaks to a real failing of neoliberalism not knowing where to go, which, you know, it's sort of a culmination of a political, an economic, and a social crisis. And, and that dimension, when you focus on, I'll call it great men, notwithstanding the Janet Yellens of the narrative, um, you know, narrative misses that aspect of, uh, of sort of political economy, if you will. I think that's a, that's a, that's a good... Um that's a much appreciated uh, remark, actually. Um, I think, uh, uh, and I would agree with you, I, I guess I was trying to integrate elements of action and reaction like that, I think most directly by means of my Hitler, right? So Hitler is, in a sense, a backlash effect like that built into the narrative I provided you with. American military power gets made to address a backlash against a failed prior strategy of the 1920s, which is a kind of neoliberal, literally neoliberal security strategy. So I like, I'm in sympathy with your argument, and I agree that Kalecki is very useful. This is this Polish Marxist Keynesian of the 1940s who argued that Keynesianism was doomed to be constantly summoned when crisis strikes, and then when it succeeds in restoring economic growth, to be dismissed as an encumbrance of the business class because too much full employment is a bad thing too, only then to let loose the forces of the market which lead to another crisis whereupon the Keynesians will be summoned again. So again, I like that logic because it speaks directly to my sense that what we need to think about is not order, because in a Kalekian vision of the world there never is order, what there is is the contradictory process of capital accumulation, which produces conflicting, incoherent demands for politics of this type and then that type and then this type and then that type. And Geithner seems to me to be a classic exponent of this. He's a man almost entirely without principle. Um, he's about doing what's necessary at the moment, right? So he's a real Kalekian kind of subject. The forces that drive that, I agree, go beyond these people 
I don't think of them necessarily as great men. The reference to Napoleon was a little bit more just about the fact that he's very short, and very, very dynamic, and very muscular. Um, but, but they are expressive of these kind of contradictory logics. I also agree with you on the point that you were making about um, the backlash with regards to class. I had that in my story by way of um, the Southern strategy and the paradoxes of the Southern strategy. Uh, in the sense that the southern strategy involved tying ever more aggressively asserted business interests to nationalist, xenophobic, white, working class, and above all, male votes. And that, uh, that strategy uh, is extraordinarily tense. And there have been lots of moments already from the early 90s onwards. Reagan was the high point, perhaps, of that moment. Uh, but NAFTA already exposed how difficult it was to get key agenda, liberalising agendas through on those terms. And I think with Trump we, and 2008, we really see it pulling, pulling radically apart. So I think that that's a really, I, in spirit, I agree with you. I'm sorry it didn't come across uh, uh, more, more clearly. But I think that's the, the, for me, this is very much thinking through the implications of the story I told in Crash. So it may also be a sense in which I'm sort of shuffling the cards in my own head. And, and moving away from a story that was driven so heavily there by the logic of financial markets and trying to think through literally this experience of meeting this guy, uh, how he recounted his own 20-year experience of power and how that does not does not mesh with these simplistic historical narratives we have in other places full of other people doing the whole kind of wonky thing in places like Davos. That's the immediate context which this particular talk came out of, but I, I agree with you about the, the need to put that political economy, uh, have that in the background, for sure, as the driver. Okay, we'll have two more questions. I have seven together. Would you prefer? Well, maybe together. Maybe two questions. Okay. Is that me? Oh, you good. Uh, the, uh, the kids have been going on strike. Uh, you may have noticed all over the world about uh, your second issue, climate yeah. change. Uh, now, that's a kind of radical uh, attempt to sort of encourage some more global governance on this, this issue. I just wondered if you had some thoughts about from what you've seen and studied uh, in relation to governance, whether climate change does present unique challenges that are completely different from mm -hmm. all the things you've talked about before. Yes. And one final question. Over here. Um, Adam, do you think that um, the narrative that you've outlined this evening does challenge a dollar-centric financial system? Do you think that actually it's unsustainable to have a dollar-centric financial system and an industrial, uh, a China-centric uh, in, uh, in, industrial system? Yeah. Um, let me start with that one uh, and then uh, buy myself a little bit more time to think about <laughs> climate change. But, um, It's, it's certainly one of the most extraordinary... I mean, in a world full of, of tensions and incoherence, um, you know, what, what the Germans used to call the contemporaneity of the uncontemporaneous, um, you know, the, the, this disjuncture between the productive hub of the world economy, which is now so clearly centred on East Asia, and that's what the CO2 numbers tell you, so that's where all the physical activity is going on. I don't know if you've seen this stat, but China poured more concrete between 20... 50% more concrete between 2011 and 2013 than the United States poured in the entire 20th century. <laughs> um, right. And that coincides with a monetary system, which, as you rightly say, is, continues to be centred on the dollar, uh, one of the ways we thought this would go down is that 2008 would be the moment where the dollar of hegemony broke, right? That was the simple story we all had that made life really easy for us. In fact, I have a 
slide showing it. Yeah. That's the way we thought 2008 would work out. That's the economist from 2007, fall of 2007. Right? And that, that's the opposite of what happened. It turned out that every bank in the world desperately needed dollars and the Fed was on hand to provide them. And so every bank in the world got the message that if you want to conduct currency, you want to conduct business in a global currency, if you do it in dollars, you're in good hands. They know how to manage this system. Um, and China is, in fact, if anything, more and more hooked on it. And, and, and in the sense that rather than internationalizing China, China's privates, uh, uh, businesses have taken advantage of cheap dollar funding in the way everyone else has. And so the extraordinary thing happened in 2015-16, which is the opposite of 2008, which is a huge hemorrhage of funds out of China. Uh, and this was a moment in which China, therefore, became dependent on cooperation from Janet Yellen's Fed uh, in 2016. And, um, and uh, Powell is doing them a solid right now in postponing the rise of interest rates because we know how dicey things look in China at this moment. So it, there was a vision in which it looked as though they got it, right? The Fed understood the role. It couldn't openly say or too openly say that we are the guardians of a global financial system because it is an institution answerable to a national parliament. It is a national monetary system and the, con the nationalists are on the warpath. And the Chinese could rely on assistance from them. And now, of course, we have a president who, you know, eagerly tweets about the collapse of the Shanghai stock market as evidence for the fact that he's winning the trade war. That, that, is not, that is not the ideal scenario. But cooperation goes on. I think it's remarkable the way to which Powell, as Fed chair, has in fact continued to, to do this, uh, to, to in fact conduct a policy which is cooperative. I mean, it plays into the accusation from several people that this is top-down history. Uh, but one of the ways in which it was explained that Yellen and the Fed was taking this position was that the, the Fed board included Stanley Fisher in 1516, who was formerly the, uh, the head of the Israeli Central Bank. Um, so it, in fact, integrated an emerging market banker uh, as a member of the American Policymaking Committee. And America being a multi-ethnic society, you can imagine how you play this out. I mean, it's an absurd vision of how you organize global governance by means of the incorporation of diasporic elites into American policymaking, because it seems like it's the only way you get out of the impasse of having a global system dependent on a national actor. I mean, it's mad. Really, you know, it's kind of a reductio ad absurdum of the elite nature of this kind of politics. Um, I don't know how, it, how we progress uh, from there. And, and I think it's a constant, you know, that is the excitement of watching financial markets, if, you might, if I might put it so glibly, uh, and the current moment is precisely road testing that scenario. Climate change, climate change, I was going to say another version of this talk. I mean, the one way of making the connection is, you know, America got into global governance in the Wilsonian movement over what they took to be what they understood as the existential question of total war. That was the driver, right? And Wilson's mission, and one should credit him with this, was attempting to ban that. In the name of all that was holy, every human value insisted that America should stay outside this. He described it as a, it would be a crime against civilization for America, the great white power, he emphatically understood it that way, to allow itself to be sucked into Europe's war and to win it for Britain and France. A crime against civilization, no less. Um, and there are moments in the Cold War where, after all, the emergence of this American hyperpower and its counterpart in the Soviet Union created moments of absolutely existential threat for humanity. And it's difficult, I think, to convey for those who didn't live through it. I only experienced the 1980s version. My parents lived through the 1960s Cuban Missile Crisis it really did seem as though not just something bad was going to happen, but the entire, I mean, you were talking about moments of peril that we face now. I think the Cuban Missile Crisis was worse, right? bad as Brexit is. That really did look like the end of the world. And I, I remember how terrified we were living in West Germany about Ronald Reagan. It looked as though we were in the hands of a madman, or at least somebody who was a buffoon, who had his finger on the button. And, and that produced a move back, right? It produced a move towards ordering, uh, reordering. But it, thinking about the geometry of it, it's, it's such a simple problem. It is an elite problem. It's centered at the very highest levels of governance. It is on the one hand humanity's fate and on the other hand decision making by a tiny elite locked into extraordinarily refined mechanisms thinking about a deterrence and how it works and how it doesn't work. The climate change problem is so much more complex and yet on the basis of the IPCC report of this fall, how, last fall, how can we deny the fact that it's, they're telling us we have no excuse for not thinking that this is not an apocalyptic threat to hundreds of millions of people? Um, and yet, you know, 
everything around us in this hall right now is shaped and implicit and in, in implicated in the carbon civilization that is causing that problem. The lights shining on me right now, the computer, every, all the clothes that we're wearing, every way in which we got here, the number of flights I've taken since the beginning of the year, like everything is implicated in it. So it's a decision for transformation which is massively more radical. Um, and so I think it poses, it absolutely poses, the question was simply, does it pose unique problems of governance? I mean, you bet you. I mean, it, it, it requires an upheaving of the entire material foundations of our civilization since the 19th century, since the 18th century. Um, and most fundamentally of all, and this is the really difficult thing, and I mean it absolutely seriously, it is no longer our problem to decide. That is, you know, as many adorable Scandinavian teenagers as we can mobilize, it will not make a damn bit of difference. This is not our question. We started it. We started the ball rolling. Much of the CO2 out there, we put there. But if the question is how do we control it in the next 20 to 30 years, nothing we do makes a fundamental difference. We should do our part. We should pioneer those technologies. We should be generous in technology transfer, the opposite of where we're at with the 5G struggle. Um, but it is their emissions that decide this. And those emissions are their aspirations to an approximation of a decent material, what we take for granted as a decent material standard of living. Right? So it poses the most fundamental question to the nation state projects of the two largest countries on earth, India and China. They have to somehow square it with their own politics as to how they figure out and we know what the decisions are. It's basically about the decision of China and India to use coal-fired power plants. That's the critical issue. Uh, and that in India is a regional decision. <laughs> that will be made province by province across India. Um, so that, I think, is the other way in which, to me, you know, we really need to step back. America acts as our surrogate as Westerners. It's a way in which we think agency. I mean, this is the, you know, why Varoufakis could invoke the New Deal. Even for him, it stands as a moment of agency. Greece, after all, was a major recipient of Marshall Plan aid. Like, we feel part of that drama. The biggest adjustment we have to make in thinking about climate change is that we are provincial. We are, we are bystanders uh, in what will decide the fate of humanity. Thank you.